we have understood the need for change in organisations. That we get. The question is how to get there. And they say that leaders are merchants of hope. But unfortunately, as I deliver the first half of this presentation, it's going to make you feel a little hopeless, uh, a little depressed, maybe. Um, in the second part, what I want to show you is an intervention that I believe helps to lead us to transform. Uh, and I'm going to build on the shoulders of giants, as we tend to do. I'm going to show you two illustrious people in the world of leadership, uh, who, and I can only hope to put a pebble on top of that uh, in order to build something that I think really works and may interest you. It's a coaching intervention. I'm going to show you a little bit of video later on as to how it works. Um, but let me just bring you up to the state of play. So, Okay, no, 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 no. If you, <laughs> from the top, please. Right to the beginning. Thank you. That's it. Okay, can I operate from here? Okay, so, first slide. Thank you. First slide. Thank you. That's it. Um, it seems that in the 20th century and in the early 21st century, we have been trapped in a psychic prison. Uh, we are led by gods that should not lead us. Um, to advance this? To advance this? It's not advancing. No. It, it's not working. No. To advance it? Okay, you are using your computer, I think. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Laptop, okay. All right. So, keep it. <laughs> not that this makes me feel stressed. I'm very calm standing up here. I'm very zen. <laughs> If I can give you some instructions just to move the slides down as we go, that will be fine. We're going to go very quickly through the first part. And this cannot go on YouTube. Happy. And on the other hand, to find routes to happiness that we otherwise can't find. The reality is our leaders have been letting us down and the paths are getting narrower and darker. Can you advance one? It's not advancing. Corporations play a big role in this world. We're dominated by corporate life. We see these brands everywhere. They have a responsibility and the leaders of these organizations have a responsibility to develop people and to help them on the pathways to spirituality. But it's not happening. And if we look at our leaders, one more please, uh, in all walks of life, we feel let down. Here you see the leaders of the investment banking community in front of the Senate less than a couple of years ago. In fact, the person, the gentleman you see on my left, Lloyd Blankfein, used to be my boss. For 22 years I worked in investment banking. For 17 years I worked at Goldman Sachs. And that used to be a badge of honour for me. And now, unfortunately, I feel ashamed. This is what the banking industry has become. Luckily, I escaped about nine years ago and entered a different path, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the brackets to that later. One more, please. <clears throat> if this is what the world has come to 30 years after Live Aid, if we still have to look at pictures like this, then what use are organizations, and what are organizations for? We know that they can make excess profits, but what do they actually deliver to humanity? One more. And here we see our political leaders who have also let us down. In this picture, more interested in cheering on football games than actually turning around the economies which are creating such enormous disparities in society. Leaders of business, Enron being just one of many examples where the leaders have completely destroyed value and destroyed culture. Political leaders of any persuasion, in some ways reprehensible, and we could produce so many here. One more, please. And here we have the, cl the, cl the clown prince himself, Berlusconi, again leading Italy to where? And then we had our sporting heroes. Again, if 
you look at Lance Armstrong in the bottom right hand of this, of this picture, behaviour that actually suggests winning is more important than the means to get there. And then finally our spiritual leaders, and I say this with caution of course because I don't want to create any offence, but here we see people also that in some ways have led their followers into a rather darkened path. In short, we've lost our compass. I don't think we know where true north is. And we live in a world of chaos, and we've not been taught to make sense of this chaos. We don't know how to be wise stewards of the challenges and dilemmas that confront us. <clears throat> I think we can pass. Keep going. Thank you. So how do we find our true north? What is the way forward? <clears throat> I'm going to miss out these quotes in the interest of time, so let's keep going. <clears throat> One more. So the pathways to transformation. How are we going to get there? Uh, I'll start by showing you uh, maybe a short video clip of our starting point. <clears throat> How do we move people from here? And maybe if you can dim the lights and watch this for a few moments. And he, rather to everyone's surprise, mystification, he, he, he said, If we get this right today, people will squeeze some of those shorts. Squeeze them hard. <laughs> Not that I want to hurt them. Don't get that, please, because that's just not who I am. I am soft. I'm lovable. But what I really want to do is I want to reach in, rip out their heart, and eat it before they die. Dick Ford also had an insatiable appetite for profits with or without fava beans. We can see, especially to this gathered audience, how frightening that is as a, a human being running an enormous enterprise with tens of thousands of people. The other who have different view. Consider part of me, part of humanity. My future also depends on them. So respect. And listen their interest and tell them our interest and try to find a mutually equitable solution. That's the only way. Not the Palestine problem. Both sides say stand firm. Then confrontation. Now 21st century, now 10 years passed. Now 90 years yet to come. Now these young people, you are the people who belongs to the first century. My new generation belongs to the century, already gone. Now ready to say goodbye. <laughs> so these young people, now you should think how to build this century, more peaceful century, more compassionate century. So, uh, peace, compassionate, does not mean no longer any problem. Problem there. So long human being there, human interest is there, different interests, different views, always there. There is no other alternative, only through talk. That's the wisdom side. Then respect others' interest, genuine sense of concern, or concern of others' well-being. That's the basis. So combine these two things, genuine spirit of dialogue can develop. What do you think? Do you agree? <laughs> Thank you. Oh. So a genuine spirit of dialogue. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu. Indeed. We'll have to have an advert. Very important in the modern world. Um, so, so how do we do that, though? I mean, it's all very well saying we have to have dialogue, we have to have respect, we have to have compassion. Yes. Tell that to a business leader, he's going to go, aha, uh -huh. yeah, I know, but is it really going to happen? Well, here's maybe how it can happen. <clears throat> we have to transform. 
And the way of transformation is a bumpy path. As you can see from this model, we go up in starts, we then go over a hump, we end up on a plateau, we move forward, we spend a long time in the plateaus of our life, and then if we're lucky, if we have any kind of introspection, the ability to self-reflect, we move up one more time. Maybe we have a teacher, but sometimes it comes from within. <clears throat> now, you can't see this slide, and in a way that's a good thing. Uh, it's a very complicated. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on there. Uh, my colleague uh, Roberto on the stage has already talked about Piaget. There are many, many different models of adult development theory. I'm going to focus on one. And what does that mean? It means they're pursuing their own needs. They relate to others only to get their own needs met. And the way that they lead is one of dictator, my way or the highway. And for those of you that have worked in organizations, you will recognize that there are leaders out there who still behave this way. Luckily, only 5%. Next stage is the socialized mind. Now, this is where they just move beyond adolescence, 19, 20 years old. However, and this is the depressing bit, over 70% of adults, research shows, are still there. 70% of adults are still only at the socialized phase. What does that mean? It means that they identify themselves with their role. In other words, if I'm the CEO, that is what defines me. I'm not a free spirit. My soul is not free to pursue the things it needs to pursue. If I hear the call of what my soul questions for, I ignore it. And the way that these people lead is generally hierarchical, but somewhat benevolent. But 70% of leaders are in this state of mind. So now we've got 75% of adults captured by these first two. Then we move to the independent. These are also known as self-transforming. The previous one was self-authoring. Self-transforming, what does this mean? It means that you no longer ignore the call of your soul. But that means that your path may disappoint other people. You will no longer do things just for the sake of maybe your parents. You'll do it for yourself. Your worth is not tied up in what you do, and you operate, and this is very important, from your deep center. You operate from your deep center. There are only 20% of adults that function at this level. 20%. So now we have packaged up nearly 95% of adult humanity. The next two phases that Keegan talks about for the purposes of this audience are maybe the most interesting. The integral, I engage my different sides. This was what Roberto was talking about a little earlier. He had a different name for it, but that's what he was saying. And this means you have a more community orientation. And finally, the unitive. I'm a soul in communion with the rest of humanity, I meet with the divine and you operate from a position of global vision. Less than half of 1% of adults ever get there. And only 5% make it to the integral. Now, if we are going to create a better world in which organizations which to some extent dominate our world are going to operate and make us happier and freer, then we better figure out how to transform some of the leaders working within them. Next slide, please. Two people. You can't read these, but I'm going to offer you the handouts, and I'll just send you this slide deck if you want it. So in the interest of time, we'll skip this. But this is Dr. Robert Keegan, who I work with from Harvard, who wrote the book that I mentioned, and that is his theory. Next slide, please. And then I want to link this to a guy that I work with from INSEAD, a guy called Dr. Manfred Kestevries. Of course, we need to become centered in ourself. We need to understand where we are, why we've become what we've become, and what is our path forward. Why am I the leader that I am today? How did I get there? In, in order to understand that, we need to reflect. We need to look backwards. And then we may have a chance of engaging on a spiritual path, if that's what we choose. So Keegan has framed it for us, Kets de Vries says, thank you, you can go forward. Kets de Vries, this is Kets de Vries, and you're going to see him in a minute on a video. He says, we need to become truly reflective leaders. And in order to do that, we need to become twice born. In order to become twice born, 
we need to take an inner journey. And we're not going to take that inner journey just because we decide to. Someone needs to kickstart you and make it happen. So what I'm going to show you is a coaching intervention that we use that makes this happen, which I've used a number of times myself, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Next slide, please. We'll skip this video. Next one. Thank you. So this is the inner journey. This is a painting, as you may know, by Magritte. Know thyself. How do we get to know ourselves better? <clears throat> Next one. We stand at a crossroads. Are we going to take the path less travelled, or are we going to take an easier path? My friend here on the platform, Swami Chinandra, quoted Scott Peck. Scott Peck had another interesting statement. He said, the earth is a spiritual boot camp. It's there for us to take if we choose it, but do we choose it? Often not. So, why don't we talk about how we can make it happen? <clears throat> We can make it happen by entering into a dialogue with others. Keep going. <clears throat> that dialogue, I suggest, can only take place in groups where we support each other, work with each other, engage with each other, connect with each other. Keep going. So I'm going to talk to you very briefly about this intervention. And for anyone that's interested in this intervention, I will send you an article about it afterwards. The, article, the, the intervention is psychodynamic executive coaching. Sounds complicated, it really isn't. It's really about getting executives round the table, talking with each other and engaging with each other and having a different kind of conversation to the conversation that they normally would. And, in, and as a result of that, we coach, we work with them, they coach each other, they listen to each other, they take a deep plunge into themselves. Next slide, please. We ask them to do three things. One, we ask them to draw a self-portrait of themselves. For many people, this is the first point of enormous resistance. You're going to see someone do this in a moment. This self-portrait is based on a number of elements. What is in your head, your heart, your gut? How do you consider work and leisure? How do you consider the past and the future? And all of these elements we bundle up and ask them to draw. They're not allowed to write anything, they draw. This is a typical image that comes back, often very complicated. It gives people a, a way of starting to make sense of who they are. It starts to inform them of their life story. It informs their consciousness. Next slide. We also use a couple of instruments, as you can imagine. We use some feedback instruments. You cannot do this work yourself. You need external output as well. So we get out external output from the people around them in the organizations using an instrument that looks like this. Next slide. We also use an instrument that gets input from their family and friends. Something that looks like this. There's a lot of information starts to flow. Keep going. So, why don't we now take a look at this intervention in action. It's eight minutes long. I hope you find it interesting. What you're about to see is the top team of a company in, involved in this intervention. Now, I should say to you that this, what you're going to see takes eight minutes. This process normally lasts for a day and a half. To give you a sense of how deep we go with people, you're getting a very, very small microcosm of what happens. You'll see the CEO, you're going to see the CFO, and you're going to see a couple of his subordinates on the top team of this company who very kindly agreed to, to, to perform this for us. Okay, so we can show this video, and I'll talk a little bit about it afterwards. I think it's high time that this, this company, if we are going to move into the future, um, that we take on basically the human element. Um, and I think it's high time that these, certainly these four people spoke to one another. I don't really think that I am like I was portrayed by other people. I don't think they really appreciate how much, uh, how much work I put in. Uh, they see it as interfering, which um, was a bit of a surprise to me. So I'm not looking forward to it at all. So how do you all feel being here? 
a little bit confused. Mm -hmm. And you know why we're here. Every team, even this great functioning team, might sometimes have some undiscussable, some snakes on the carpet. So maybe when we go through this process, eventually it is more easier for all of you to have what I sometimes call courageous conversations. One of my challenges is going to be made here a rather playful place, a transitional space. Uh, building trust. Now to get you a little bit into the playful mood, into this transitional space, and don't look so gloomy about it, Tanya, I found a very u useful tool is to do yourself portrait. I want you to draw, be artistic, and associate when you draw to a few things, like your head, your heart, your stomach, oh. stomach, yes, the stomach too, <laughs> leisure, work, the future, and the past. No words, just free associations. So don't sit there in a catatonic state. Get up and start drawing. This is the past. And so I left one of us behind. And so she's the future for me. Um, this, I mean, it's really corny. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is um, the way I feel about her and my family. This, <laughs> surprisingly enough, is my work. Because that's it's based in her stomach as though, it was, as though it was a baby. And as UNESCO would say, woman is the future of mankind. And I see, I see what we're doing, what we're doing actually here and now and will be doing in the future. The green energy will save the planet. So this is, this is our future. And I feel as protective about this as I would of a baby. I first want to share some of the data of the jelly. You know, there's an element, there's quite a discrepancy between the way you see yourself and how others see yourself. Mm. What stuck out for me was the incredible high scores you got in vision, which is, I think, extremely rarely seen, that you really have, you know, really a very good perspective on your future developments and things like that. It's very clear. This is as high as it comes. What also strikes me, you are very high on stress, which is uh, a little bit worrisome, which I think is related to some of the also health concerns you have. Of course, you got also the personal feedback comments from, uh, from friends and family members. He's the most creative person I've ever known. Nice. Other person showing enthusiasm, creating a sense of the bigger picture, being friendly, approachable, great use of humor. Other person smart, gets, the essence, gets to the essence of an issue. Other person is the most stimulating boss I have ever worked for. I mean, those are nice, nice comments. Yes. Uh, develop, some people shove it into develop, you know. He needs to be better organized and more attentive to the needs of his direct report and the broader S&M team. He invests way too little time. When he's focused on the people issue, he's fine, but he is too rarely focused. Is that you? I'm going to ask you something which might be difficult for you which is to, as you know in the previous sessions, to be silent and just listen very carefully what other people have to say. What animal comes to your mind when you think of your... What, him? Yeah. Well, I went home early the other night and my son was watching a film called Ice Age, which is a cartoon film, and it's set in the Ice Age. And at the beginning it has a crazy squirrel, a frantic squirrel, that dashes around chasing an acorn. And it Catches, get, sometimes gets the acorn, the acorn always escapes. And it seems to me that this is the situation he's in. He's not that focused enough. He isn't exactly. You have to get your eye on the ball. That's what I would say. Tame that squirrel boy. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya, if you work for Joe, what would it be like? I wouldn't like to work for him, no. I would feel very frustrated why this nice person you would not like to work for him? You never answer your phone. I mean, this is the most creative person I've seen in a long time, according to the ratings. What does he do that he frustrates you? Well, he's never there. He's, he's always late for everything. I mean, not everything. But he's meeting. important. Everybody's important. Ah. And but he's more important because he's the visionary part. Then you're right, yes, the creativity. Maybe yes, yes. Maybe, maybe yes. Yes, I would, I would enjoy to have someone in my team like Joe with his qualities. All right. After, after having been uh, compared to different animals and other comments being, how do you feel? Well, it's strange because you're actually, um, you hold up a mirror, plainly, and you see three different versions of yourself. And, and I suddenly understand 
people's frustrations and I suddenly understand that, yeah, it is something that I have to take on board. What are the two things you'd work on? Making it more transparent that I do respect people and I realize that I'm only part of an organization, I realize. How would you do that? Okay, so you see a little bit of this work that we do. And I want to tell you a little bit about some of the results that come from this. Um, you're all interested in metrics, no doubt. I can't give you metrics, but I, I've studied this information uh, and this intervention for my PhD thesis. We have now worked with over 14,000 executives using this intervention. Uh, those 14,000 executives have had over 140,000 observations made. Each of them have been through this day and a half where they became more aware of themselves, of their ways of functioning, of their motivations, of their life stories. And as a result of that, as you can see from the end of this clip, we ask them to commit to some kind of a transformation. What is it that, would you, that you would like to do? Because as one of our guests said yesterday, we can't change anybody. They will only change if they want to. So we invite them to make change. And what we've discovered as a result of putting people through this is that three months later, when we come back and measure it, people have gone through remarkable transformations. And I'm just going to share one of them with you. And actually, it's the most recent one, because there, for me, have been so many. I've coordinated 400 groups, so over 2,000 people using this intervention. I'm just going to tell you about one that happened last week. There was a guy uh, from Japan, and his folks lived in Tokyo, and he lived in Osaka, which as you know is another big city, but it's a long way away. And he had three children, and his wife living in Tokyo, and he basically commuted. But he didn't commute once a day, and he didn't even commute once a week. He went back and saw his family once a month. And I said, so you're actually spending 24 days a year with your family. You have a seven-year-old son, you have a five-year-old daughter. And as we talked about this, he started to cry. And I said to him, you're obviously very moved as you tell this to the group, but there is obviously something that's moving you. What is it that you want to do? And of course, if your timing is right, you'll get the right answer. And he said, well, I want to be with them. And of course, in the group, it just took someone else to say to him, so why don't you? So we phoned him, we phoned the group two weeks later, just before I came here, and said, so what's happened? Because we check in. And he said, I went back on Monday morning, and I said to my boss that I'm going back to Tokyo, and if that means I'm losing my job, so be it, but I'm going to be with my family. And that, for me, is what transformation is about, because this is a man who chose the right path for himself, for his family. And for me, I find deep spirituality in just that, because this was a man who suddenly lost his fear and got out of the way of himself and made a profound and important choice, not only for him, but for three other people around him. And if we can replicate that, we're doing a lot of good in the world. So there are two things that I'm going to just say to, to finish off here. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Only please. by simplifying no, the world. No, no more of him. <laughs> next slide. Thank you. Oh, we're ending. That's okay. So there are two things that I want to say just to finish. And I hope that I can engage in dialogue with you about this, what I think is very important subject of development by connecting with you via LinkedIn or whatever means that you want to, to continue the dialogue that we might start here. But there are two things that leaders need to do. They need to connect and they need to create. And in order to do that, the only way they will do that is to take the inner journey. Forty years ago, as a ten-year-old boy, I walked into a library and for reasons that I cannot tell you, 
I took a book off the bookshelf and the book was called The Life of the Buddha. And my family was not a religious family. I came from a broken home. <coughs> and I took the book and I read it and I then wrote a small project. And that project won first prize. I'm not sure why that happened either. I still have this document now. But it moved me in a way that I didn't know. It didn't move me profoundly at the time because I became an investment banker. So I saw the dark side. But I'd like to think that that book that I pulled off the shelf 40 years ago is maybe the reason why I'm standing in front of you today as a 50-year-old man. And I hope that this journey continues not only alone, but with some of you too. Thank you very much for listening.